Well, good morning, Rock Church. How's everybody doing? You guys good? Good, good, good. Great to see you on this beautiful uh, Memorial Day weekend. And uh, I love today because it's the kind of official kickoff of summer. Who, who's a, a summer fan with me? All right, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. I got a bunch of kids like, dude, I'm out. Yeah, um, and uh, so I love summertime, love just all the things that come with it, whether that's beach trips or uh, family vacations or, or just some relaxation, stuff like that. Um, and we're, we're excited about going into this summer. Guys, I, I will tell you, I, I really believe uh, that this summer we're going to experience the best summer ever at, at the Rock Church. I, I really believe God has in store for us a summer that will be like none other. And um, I, I think that's for several reasons. One huge one is we are sending more uh, students and adults off to Catalyst camps than we ever have in the history of our church. And uh, yeah, you know, and I know what happens at those events. Um, I, I love uh, going to them. I love speaking at them. And I know what happens, man. People get charged up. They come back. And, and the ripples, they just continue out throughout our whole church. So between that, between... Uh, the Catalyst programs between uh, starting a Thursday night service towards the end of the summer, getting into our new building. There's just some great things that are in store this summer, and uh, I think uh, God's just going to do some huge things. And my prayer is, as a church, but also as an individual, you will say, man, I want to ride that wave, that, that I want to ride that wave that God is pushing all right, and, and that's really the series that we're going to deal, uh, deal with for the next five weeks. We're going to be in this series that's called Mavericks. We just thought it'd be a fun way to kick off the summer, to kind of talk some surf language, talk uh, about some Bible characters, kind of mash everything together, all right? And understand with the term Mavericks, there's, there's really two different thoughts uh, with that. One, a maverick, if you define it from a surf culture, is a place out in California. There's a town called Mavericks, and um, they will have uh, what they call maverick waves. They're, they're ginormous waves, huge waves that only the best of the best are willing to ride. I mean, the, the height, the depth, the power inside that wave is at a point that the average surfer, um, they're not even going to think about going out there because these are waves that are only for the best. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, there's a show on TV that is uh, called Titans of the Mavericks because anybody who would actually attempt to ride one of these waves basically is like a titan. All right, so the term maverick with our series, it kind of comes from that, but there's another aspect of, of mavericks, and that's kind of an older term that maybe you're a little more familiar with, kind of Webster's Dictionary term of a maverick means someone who is unorthodox or different. And, and I believe we have a lot of unorthodox and different people who call the rock home. You can look at that positively and with a little bit of humor. Um, but we, we truly do. As a church, we have a lot of unorthodox people. And I know personally, that's how I want to live life. Uh, I don't want to live some mundane, boring life and just kind of make it through life. No, I want to do things that are unorthodox. I want to do things that are maybe considered dangerous. I want to do things that are uh, like taking a risk. I, I want to do things that are different. I want us to do ministry that is different than others. I had one of my buddies just text me right before I came up on stage. He's like, dude, I can't believe that's the way you're starting service. I'm like, why not? <laughs> you know, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's have some fun, you know, because church isn't supposed to be boring, right? Amen. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to laugh a little bit. And we're going to have a good time hanging out with each other and hanging out with God. All right, so we want to do things different. We want to be a little unorthodox, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the next five weeks. And what I want us to make sure we catch with this is as we're talking about riding a wave is we need to make sure before we go any further that we understand where the power of the wave comes. Because I truly believe, like I said, that this summer is going to be the best summer ever in the history of our church. And I believe that there's going to be an incredible wave that we get to ride. But do we make the wave? Who makes the waves? God does. Scripture says he decides how far the wave comes in. He decides how far the wave goes out. God is the creator of the waves. And whatever wave we might get a chance to ride as a church, it is not because something we are doing as a church. It is because the power of God is at work and is being displayed. And that's the kind of wave I'd like to ride. 
Is it dangerous? Yeah. Is it crazy? Yeah. Is it fun? Yeah. And it takes some, some people who are willing to go, wow, wow I'll, I'll jump in and, and I'll try that. So we're going to look at some biblical characters that, that are basically mavericks, pe- people who are kind of riding the wave of God, who are doing things different. Now, let me say this as I start in this series to, to make sure you're aware of it. One, if you're a parent, this is a, one of those series that, that every now and then we, we are totally linked up on. And what I mean about that is uh, what we are studying this morning in here is the same thing uh, that your child, if you have a kid that's in Kids Rock, that they're studying. So when you're sitting around at lunch today, you're going to be able to have conversations about the same biblical character. And this is the same biblical, uh, same principle that will will also play out when when Catalyst starts back up in two weeks. So what happens on Sunday mornings in here, Sunday morning in Kids Rock, Wednesday night and Thursday night in Catalyst, then all of those will be the same story. So as a parent, you can have great conversations. All right. Now today we're going to dig into this biblical character, and, and I will say this: this is an it's a, especially a message that is geared for the young men, young adults, uh, young uh, just the males of our church. Okay, from young men to old men. All right. Now, does that mean, ladies, you don't need to listen? Absolutely not. All right, because obviously there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to be able to say, oh, I I can pull this out from my life as well. Or there's going to be ways that it's going to help you understand men better. But we're going to look at a biblical character, a man who by most men would say, dude, I want to be like him. Maybe you've heard of the guy before. His name is Samson. Samson is considered one of the strongest men of all time. Like his strength is of like biblical proportions. He is just the man. And anytime as a kid you start studying Samson, you see this great big like Hulk dude, you know, with great strength that that can just use his strength however he wants. So he's a guy that a lot of us dudes would go, dude, love to be like that. But then when you really start digging into his life, you'll notice a lot of other things as well. And what, you'll, what, what I would say I would primarily want to say today, and I think it's something that we'll all catch, is this. That AT&T is calling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that was at a perfect pause moment, though. But anyway, um, this is what we're going to catch today, is that strong men have a habit of becoming weak men. What makes strong men weak? (laughs) Somebody's one step ahead of me. (laughs) But it's true. It's true, I'll get there, but let, let's, let's just deal with this a little bit. What makes strong men weak, all right? And we can look at Samson's life, and we can see some areas that he was weak. And the first area we would look at is women, okay? Now, every lady, especially moms, you've seen this. You see young men fall in love, and they lose their mind, right? I mean, they're just like, uh, 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 she's, uh, uh. Uh, right? Because guys, they just, around women, strong men become weak. I've seen a lot of good men become weak because of bad women. Now, I can flip that and say I've seen a lot of good women become weak because of bad men. So as we first look at Samson, the first thing we got to look at is we got to understand this principle of, uh, of what made him weak. So let me back up and give you a little history of Samson, okay? So Samson, his mom and dad, married, wanted to have kids, were never able to have kids. They were struggling, just like, we want kids, we want kids. And then all of a sudden, an angel showed up. And when an angel showed up, said, hey, you're going to be uh, pregnant. You're going to have a child, and your child is going to help free the Israelites from the uh, dominion, from the slavery, from the oppression of the Philistines. 
And she's like, well, well that, that sounds great. And so she ran and told her husband, hey, I just had a man of God, an angel of God come and tell me that we're going to have a kid and, and that he's going to help free the Israelites from the dominion of the Philistines. And I love um, what happened because the, the guy's like, well, how's this going to be? And then all of a sudden the angel shows up there. And then he says this. He says, please teach us how to raise this kid. Man, that's powerful, parents. If maybe you've got, you know, maybe you're, you're pregnant or maybe you're trying to have kids, the best prayer you could probably pray is, God, teach me how to raise this child. They ask this angel that question. When they ask the angel that question, the angel says, all right, here's what I want you to do. He is going to be set apart from birth for God's purpose. He's going to be set apart. And what we want to do is we, uh, he needs to have, be a Nazarite from birth. Okay, now a Nazarite, they would have understood this because they would have went back to the Levitical laws, the book of Leviticus early on in the Bible. And, and there was a, a section of Leviticus that, that talked about a Nazarite vow. Now, all that meant was this, that if you were taking a Nazarite vow, you were saying that I am being consecrated. I am being set apart for God. But with that, there were some things that you couldn't do. All right, a, a Nazarite vow would mean one that you wouldn't eat anything uh, that was unclean. Specifically, you wouldn't eat anything that was dead, that came from a, a dead carcass, a dead animal, something like that. All right. Secondly, that you would not eat or drink anything that came from the vine. All right. So meaning, don't eat grapes, don't drink juice, uh, don't drink alcohol. All right. So a Nazarite would take a vow saying, I'm not going to eat anything unclean, and I'm not going to eat or drink anything that comes from the vine. Or third, I'm not going to cut my hair, okay? So Samson had these three vows. So from the very beginning of his life, his mom and dad said, this is how we're supposed to raise this child, so we're going to set him apart. And for his early years in life, they raised him according to those biblical principles, according to what that angel of the Lord said. But then one day, Samson was off on his own. They did everything right. Yet he chose a different path. There's some of you parents that I know are struggling with that right now. Because you're like, man, I've been doing it right. And all of a sudden my, my child hit uh, this age or they graduated and they went off and did this. And, and it seems like they've left some of these biblical principles that I tried to instill in them. Okay? You keep doing what you know is right. And then as adults, as upper teenagers, whatever, whatever age group you want to call that in, then they're going to have to start making some decisions. So that's the reason I say right now I'm getting ready to preach to a lot of you young adults because that's where we find Samson. Okay, And in the midst of this, we see Samson and we see a struggle. We see a strong man that was made weak. Why was he made weak? One, because of women. Samson had a bad habit of chasing bad women. Okay, a strong man was made weak because of the women that he chose to chase. All right, um, it, it, we'll find it in Judges uh, chapter 14. Now, I'm going to bounce around to a bunch of scriptures today. But one thing I would challenge you with is you can go to the Bible. You can read from Judges 13 to Judges 16, and you're going to read about the life of Samson. I want to kind of tell you his life and then mix in some scriptures along the way. But in Judges 14, we see how the first thing that made Samson weak was the women that he chased. It says this, one day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all of the Israelites you can marry? Why must you go to a pagan Philistine to find a wife? All right, now, now make sure you catch the backstory here. From birth, they know the, that God has called Samson as their child to release the Israelites from the Philistines. All right, so now Samson comes and says, hey, I found a girl I'm hot for, mom and dad. And they're probably like, all right, who? And well, it's that Philistine girl. And they're like, don't you realize this is wrong. He chases a Philistine woman who worships false gods. When he's done with her, he chases prostitutes. When he's done with her, he chases another Philistine woman named Delilah. And we'll hear a little bit more about her later. But he keeps chasing these wrong ladies. 
Strong men become weak men when they chase women not of God. Let me say that one more time. Strong men become weak men when they chase women not of God. Now, I could flip that and say strong women become weak women when they chase men not of God. All right? It goes both ways there. Don't chase people who are not of God. And, and guys, I, I'll say it this way. It, man, it starts, it, it starts in the, probably in your eyes and in your mind. And what I mean by that is I'll see young men, they'll be like, man, I want to live for God. I want to do what's right. And then all of a sudden, man, this girl starts paying attention to them. And they start, you know, going, well, maybe I'll leave some of these biblical principles. Maybe I'll leave some of this, these things that I, I think are right. Maybe I'll go over here. And, well, you know, I never planned on doing that. or I never planned on going there. But, man, she said, well, if you love me. And, and then all of a sudden, man, I'm way off into left field. Because I convince myself in my mind that, well, this must be okay. I, I see young men and married men that, that'll do this, that they'll, they'll lose the battle because of their eyes. That, that you know, all of a sudden they'll, 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 they'll see some things, they'll, they'll see a, a girl and, and they'll be like, well, and they start looking. And then they go from looking to lusting and they go from lusting to undressing mentally and, and it leads you down a bad path. Guys, I want to read a scripture. It's from the book of Job. It's um, chapter 31, verse 1. It says this. This is Job. He's another hero as well. Job says this. I made a covenant, meaning I made a promise. I made a decision. I made a contract is what he's saying here. With my eyes not to look with lust. Guys, it's 2016. All right, we live um, with a beach in our backyard. You're going to see people, okay? That's going to happen. But you can make a covenant with your eyes to make sure when you're seeing people that you're looking in the right places, not the wrong places. You can make a covenant with your eyes not to look in a lustful way. Where you go, oh, I'm, I'm not going to look there. I'm going to look someplace else. And look what the verse says a little bit further. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at young women. As I was preparing this message, it was just as I started studying that verse, I just started thinking, how many times as guys get older do they look at girls who are younger? Men, let's not become weak men because of lustful thoughts. Luke chapter 11, verse 34 says this way, your eye is a lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. So make a decision to say, man, I, I don't want to become a strong man that's made weak by the women I chase who are not of God. But how else do strong men become weak? Strong men become weak because of their appetite for destruction. Uh, now let, me, let me explain a little bit about Samson here. So when he was on that road to Timnah, um, all of a sudden this lion jumped out from the bush. And when he saw this lion, it says that he reached out, he grabbed this lion and ripped this lion uh, open from its mouth. All right? Which I think, dude, pretty cool. you know. And he throws it away like it was a young goat. No big deal. And you're thinking, all right, that's good. But then a, a few days later, he's walking by, and as he's walking by, he sees the lion, and he sees some honey inside of it. Now, guys, I, let, let's think about this for a second. How many of you all love looking at roadkill? <laughs> all right, not a lot of hands going up. How many of you all eat roadkill? I hope no hands go up. Here's Samson seeing basically roadkill. He killed it along the road, so it's roadkill. He sees honey inside of it because a, a bee moved in and, and started making honey, and he scoops in and eats it. Now, guys, I'm just going to tell you something. That's disgusting. <laughs> Y'all know me, man. I got some weird eating habits. There's some things I'm like, uh-uh, I ain't touching that. Roadkill is one of them. Like, there's some things that I just crave. I'll just be honest. And there's a lot of foods I could just tell you about how, how, how I, I just, ooh, I love that food. I love that food. But probably the worst is waffles. Like, I 
love waffles. Like to the point, I, I've asked my wife, please don't ever buy Ego waffles. Because here's the problem. If there's a box in the freezer, I'm eating them until they're done. I'm not like a one-hit wonder. You know what I mean? It's like eat until the box is empty. But, but as much as I love Ego waffles, if I walked by and saw one inside of an animal, <laughs> I pass. You know what I'm saying? But Samson sees his honey and he eats of it. He had a, was consecrated at birth never to eat anything that was unclean, that came from death. But he broke that covenant. Why? Because of an appetite for destruction. He couldn't resist. We, we see it that, that even though he knew it was going to bring about his death, he was willing to do it because his appetite craved it. It's the same thing that happened with some of the women he chose, but let's talk about Delilah, the, the lady he married at the end of his life or, or towards the end of his life. Uh, as he marries Delilah, she starts, you know, she's a Philistine woman, and the Philistines are like, well, you need to find out why he's so strong. So she asks, hey, wh what makes you so strong? Well, he goes, if I was bound with some cords, I'd lose all my strength. Well, next thing you know, he wakes up, he's bound with cords, and there's Philistines getting ready to kill him. Well, he breaks the cords and he kills the Philistines. you think at that moment he would look at his wife and go, I think you're trying to kill me. But instead he says, why would you do that? Because you wouldn't tell me this, the source of your strength. Will you tell me now? What I would say is, no. But he says, well, maybe if you weave my hair together. She weaves his hair together, falls asleep. She brings in the Philistines to try to kill him again. He knew, you know, and then he woke up. That the, the strength was not in his hair being woven together, so he killed all the Philistines. You think he would understand his wife was trying to murder him. And even though he knew it was bringing his death, he kept pushing into it. Well, if you cut my hair off, that's the true source of my strength. An appetite for destruction. Now, how many times do we do the same? Strong men become weak because we, we fall to our cravings. We give in to the things that we want, even when we know those things might lead to our death. We give in to that bottle. And you say, well, I know this bottle is going to lead to my death, but you give in to it. You take a drink. Or maybe it's that bottle of prescription pills, and you're like, I, I know this isn't good, but one more day. Appetite for destruction. I, I know this needle I shouldn't be shooting up, but, but I crave this. And you've got that addictive behavior, and you're just like, I've got to have this. Or, or maybe it's that addiction towards sex, and you're like, but, but i, I got to have this. And even though you know it's leading towards your own destruction, you go for it, and, and you're like, I'm willing to do this because my appetite longs for it. Or maybe it's that appetite for success that I'll do whatever it takes, even if this success is going to kill me, it's going to ruin my marriage, it's going to ruin my family, it's going to ruin everything about me. i got this appetite, I've got this ego that needs to be stroked, and it leads us to destruction. That's how Samson, a strong man, was made weak because of his appetite for sin. There's a scripture I want to read. It says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. It says, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes. And don't miss that. This grieved Paul to say it. When I was reading this verse, it grieved me to read it. It said, With tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. I want you to think about that for a second. You say, well, man, this addiction doesn't hurt anybody except me. But what does it show? Man, man th this, this 
craving that I have, it's not a big deal. A lot of other people have those same cravings. Uh, It's not that I hate God. It's not that I dislike God. I just really like this. Our conduct shows that we are enemies of Christ and the cross. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about the shameful things they do, and they think only about this life here on earth. Samson only thought about his life in the minute, not his purpose in life, not at the end of his life, his life in the minute. And when you're only thinking about the minute, many times we fall into sin. Realize, realize the cross and eternity and live for that. Strong men become weak. One other way we see it in Samson's life. And that was in his rage and in his anger. I know none of us guys struggle with that, right? I mean, rage, anger. I, none of us have ever lost our cool. None of us have ever been hot-headed. None none of us men in this group have never said something that we wish we could take back, right? So I could probably just skip this point. (laughs) A lot of women shaking your heads. No, you preach, bro. (laughs) Let's just be real. I mean, this is an issue with Samson. And what, what is true about Samson is many times his anger was due to his own sin decisions, his own appetite for destruction. Let me explain that. I'm going to give you the life of Samson real fast, okay? So he goes and he marries this woman, this Philistine woman. And when he gets there, you know, he tells a riddle to some guy saying, hey, if you can't answer this riddle, you got to give me a bunch of clothes and, and stuff. Well, the, his wife, his new wife is like, you need to tell me the riddle. And he's like, I haven't told anybody. I'm not going to tell you. And she begs and begs and begs. So eventually he tells her the riddle. She goes and tells these guys the answer. They come back and answer the riddle correct. And then he gets mad. When he gets mad, he goes out and kills some men, brings back the clothes and gives it to these guys and then leaves his wife. He's like, I'm done with you. And he leaves. So he makes a decision. Rather than to sit and work it out, he just leaves it. When he gets away from her after a while, we don't know how long it is. We have no clue. But eventually, after a while, he's like, well, I do remember liking her. I'm going to go back to her. So he goes back. But when he gets back, she's already married somebody else. Now, when she's already married somebody else, he gets angry again. So he goes out and he ties a bunch of foxes together. Again, a crazy story in the Bible. Grabs foxes, ties their tails together, puts a torch on their tail, and sends them through the fields of the Philistines, burning the land. Well, the Philistines get mad at this, so they go and wage war against the Israelites. When the Israelites are dying, they're like, this is Samson's fault. They go to Samson. They go, Samson, we have to arrest you. He goes, well, promise me you won't kill me. They say, we won't kill you. He says, just tie me up then. They tie him up. They take him to the Philistines. He gets in front of the Philistines. He breaks the cords, picks up a jawbone of a donkey, and kills a thousand Philistines. All of this, why? Because he left his wife. He is angry. He wants revenge. Well, you're the one who walked away at first. Let's put it more practical in our lives. Maybe men, let's just talk to the married men for a second. We do something that maybe wasn't the wisest thing to do in our, in our marriage. Maybe we said something that was inappropriate or we didn't encourage the way we were supposed to or something like that. And, and then your wife comes and says something to you about it. And then you get mad at her for saying something about your mistake. And you say things that really, if you recognize my mistake at the beginning, I wouldn't even went towards anger. And you see, here's the problem, though. Too many times we go, well, he's just that way. You've said that about people, or you've heard people say that about people. Well, you know, like, yeah, every now and then he loses his cool, but he's, he's just that way. He doesn't mean anything by it. Let me read a scripture for you. Ecclesiastes verse 7, or excuse me, chapter 7, verse 9. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. James 1.20, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. I'm not proud of it, but I've stood on this stage before and told you guys this, that my number one sin habit is anger. 
It's the, it's the thing that I've prayed for 25 years that God would curb, that God would release me from. Too many times I'm, I'm too quick with my mouth or I'm too quick with my temperament. And I pray, and I hate it because there's times that, that, you know, I have to go back and apologize to people because I've just said things that, that I shouldn't have said. And, guys, I can tell you today it's better than it was 25 years ago, but it's not better because I just went, well, one day it'll work itself out. No, every day I pray, God, help me to be slow with my mouth. God, give me wisdom to say what is beneficial because... I have to admit, I'm a weak man. What makes strong men weak? Well, how about this? What, what makes weak men strong? And what makes weak men strong, what makes weak women strong is when we say, God, I need you. I need you. And I know and there's areas in my life where I have to say, God, I'm weak and I need you here. God, I need you to fulfill my appetite. And that's the reason it says in the book of Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the reason it says in John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry again. When I recognize that I need God, he can fulfill that appetite and satisfy my soul. When, when I recognize one as a married man, that I have a wife that I need to love and lead and honor, as Ephesians chapter 5 says. What makes me a strong man is when I understand I'm a weak man and I do it wrong, so I need to look at Scripture and say, Scripture, how am I supposed to love my wife? How am I supposed to lead my wife? And the Scripture says, do it as Jesus loved his church and was willing to sacrifice his life for her. Young men who maybe aren't married or young women who aren't married, then you need to be thinking in these terms. How do I make sure that I stay strong by admitting I'm weak and that I need God in my life? And I start living my life in a way that's going to honor my wife or my husband later on. Live that way and be prepared for that. I'm a weak man that loses my temper. So I need to admit, God, I need you. Because I want to be known for the way I respond to situations, not react. I want to be known for the way I respond when bad things happen. Respond when evil comes my direction. Respond when, when, when people with bad intentions say things towards me. God, I want to respond, not react. So I have to, again, I have to look at scripture and say, God, I need you. Help me to do this. Ephesians chapter 4. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that the words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. How do I do that? I admit I am weak and I need God. Strong men become weak when they live for themselves. Weak men become strong when we declare our need for God. And when you declare that need for God at a younger age, then you can live that way all of your life. At the very end of Samson's life, let me give it to you real quick. So he told Delilah the source of his strength was in his hair. And if anybody cut his hair, he'd lose his strength. So she shaved his head that night. The Philistines rushed in. He jumped up thinking he would have power, not realizing his hair was gone. They captured him. They bound him. They gouged his eyes out. They threw him in prison. We don't know how long it passed, but it was at least long enough that his hair started growing back. And one day they, they took Samson and they put him on display in front of all the Philistine officials and all the people gathered around for this big party. And they were kind of making fun of him and jeering at him, stuff like that. Well, as, as Samson was standing there, he asked the servant, he said, please put my hands on the two columns that are holding up uh, the, the roof, the, this colonnade. 
And when his hands were there, he said this prayer, very simple, similar to this. He said, dear God, I need you. And by saying, dear God, I need you, he received all of his strength again. And at that moment, it says that he pushed apart the pillars and the roof came down, killing all the Philistine officials, killing the people there, and also killing himself. It says this in Judges chapter 16, verse 30. There's this one line. It sounds like an incredible line, but it's also a tragedy because it says this. Samson killed more Philistines in his death than he did in all of his life. Now, if you're at the end of your life, you think, well, well, that's great because it means that it's not too late. And maybe that is you. Maybe, maybe you're a little bit closer to the sunset than the sunrise, if you know what I mean. And, and you might say, man, is it too late for me? No. It wasn't too late for Samson. God used him on the last day of his life when he called out to God. And if that's you, this morning I say, Call out and admit that you're weak and that you need God. But I also know this. When I've talked to older people who have come to salvation, who have cried out to God in the later parts of their life, they always say the same thing to me. I wish I would have known this when I was young. I wish I would have lived my life this way. And that's the reason I say it's a tragedy for Samson. From the day of his birth, he was set apart to be used by God. But it took him to the end of his life for him to really get it. What would have happened if he would have realized it when he was young and lived his life displaying the power of God and a life fully surrendered to God? So for those of you who are younger, I say, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Cry out to him now and say, God, I need you. I need you. Admit that you're weak because he, he will make you strong. Why don't you do me a favor? Let's stand up. We're going to go into a time of response right now. And the way we do this as a church is we're just going to sing a, sing a few songs. And it's a time for you to Just spend some time talking with God. Maybe you've never done that before, but you can take the next 10, 12 minutes and and just spend some time with God. Maybe you want to do that by coming up front and praying. If you want to do that, nobody's going to bother you. You can just come up and spend some time with God. To the right and left of the stage, there's communion. It represents the the broken body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's just a, a piece of bread and just a cup of juice. But you can take that and and you can say, God, thank you for being strong enough to go to the cross for me, for making yourself weak. And when you take that communion, what you're saying is, God, I am weak and I need your strength to make it through this life and into the next life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never admitted that you need God. Maybe you've been going through life on your own strength. And I want you to know you can come over and talk to me or one of our prayer counselors over against the wall. Or you want to step out to the orange tent, you can talk to somebody there. And you can admit, man, I need Jesus. Strong men are made weak men. When they live life for themselves and through Satan. But weak men are made strong when we cry out and say, I need God. Let's cry out this morning. Would you pray with me for a second? God, I thank you for being in our presence. And God, I pray right now that we would know that we are weak, but through you we have incredible strength. God, help us to have the courage and the strength to respond this morning in the way that we need to. Thank you, Jesus. Let's respond. 